Bonjour, agus chia div. Welcome to The Irish in Canada, the podcast exploring the histories and legacies of Irish immigrants and their Canadian descendants. I'm your host, Jane McGaughy. This is episode number six, I Love a Man in Uniform. Last time on The Irish in Canada, we talked about Ogle Gowan, who was infamous in Upper Canada for using violence as a tool to advance his own career and to show the strength of Orangemen in the colonies. What was needed to counter that wild and violent expression of Irishness was someone who was more in line with the vast majority of Irish immigrants to the Canadas, someone with family ties to the Irish countryside, who had personal knowledge of sectarianism and the British military, either for or against it, someone who had lived through the hard journey of crossing the North Atlantic on a ship meant for timber rather than people, and someone who understood the complicated reality of being an Irish person in a British empire. Fortunately, that someone was already living in Toronto. His name was Colonel James Fitzgibbon. On today's episode, we're going to talk about James Fitzgibbon's public and private life in Upper Canada in the early 19th century. Like Ogle Gowan, he also used physical force as part of his public image, but he was the polar opposite of an anti-Catholic Orangeman. In fact, James Fitzgibbon was arguably one of the best-known Irishmen in all of Upper Canada before the Great Famine. When Irish violence seemed like it was going to terrorize the countryside or spill over into the city streets, when order needed to be restored, Upper Canadians believed that James Fitzgibbon was the only man for the job. But he's been almost entirely forgotten now in the province that once held him in such high esteem. If people have heard of Fitzgibbon today, it's either because of his small part in the Laura Secord legend, he was the officer that she was trying to get to when she went on her dangerous journey through enemy lines, or because of his role in the Upper Canadian Rebellion. You probably know that game where you decide which people from history you would have over for dinner. My own list is always changing, but certainly for the last decade or so, James Fitzgibbon would absolutely receive one of my historical dinner party invitations. I think he'd get on with T.E. Lawrence, I'm not too sure about the Empress Theodora. I have such a crush on Fitzgibbon. If you look at his portraits, I'll include links to them in the show notes, there's something a bit Liam Neeson-ish about him, which is probably another reason why I love him. It's like he just stepped out of a Jane Austen novel or a Napoleonic adventure story. I can easily picture him crossing paths with Richard Sharp or Horatio Hornblower. If Captain Wentworth had been real and in the army instead of the navy, we'd have to change his name to James Fitzgibbon. And if you don't know who Captain Wentworth is, you need to pause this recording and go read Jane Austen's Persuasion immediately. In my defense, I'm not alone in being rather smitten with the man. Anna Jameson, the Irish-born wife of the Attorney General of Upper Canada, was completely charmed by Fitzgibbon when she arrived in the colony in 1836. In her widely read memoir, she wrote, Colonel F. is a soldier of fortune, which phrase means, in his case at least, that he owes nothing whatever to fortune, but everything to his own good heart, his own good sense, and his own good sword. The men who have most interested me through life were all self-educated, and what are called originals, this dear, good F is originalissimo. With all the eccentricity and sensibility and poetry and headlong courage of his country, you cannot wonder that this brave and worthy man interests me. You see, he doesn't seem real, does he? Except he was. For the first few decades of his career, Fitzgibbon seemed to be just off to one side of history's main focus, a young Catholic man from County Limerick who converted in order to become a military officer. He was then stationed outside of Ireland for the 1798 Rising. 
He fought on Lord Nelson's ship during the Battle of Copenhagen in 1801, but then was sent to Canada, missing the rest of the Napoleonic Wars. He was a destination point in the Laura Secord legend rather than being an active participant. He was the protege of Major General Sir Isaac Brock, who he saw as a second father, but that relationship was cut short. General Brock is the tragic hero of the War of 1812, the man who had the amazing idea of leading a charge uphill, on foot, in a scarlet red tunic in front of American sharpshooters. You won't be surprised to hear that he was then fatally shot through the chest. You can see the coat he was wearing if you go to the Canadian War Museum in Ottawa. Brock is fascinating. Sadly for him, he wasn't Irish. But Fitzgibbon definitely was. What really interests me, however, is not Fitzgibbon's military career, successful though it was, but his role in Upper Canada in the decades after that war. He was married in 1814. As he told Anna Jameson, There was a girl that I loved, and I knew that if I could but marry her before I was killed, she would have the pension of a captain's widow. It was all I could leave her, and it would have been some comfort to me, though not to her, poor soul. So, after the Battle of Lundy's Lane, Fitzgibbon took a leave of absence, rode nearly 200 miles from York to Adolphus Town near Napanee, was married to Mary Haley, and then left his bride on the church steps riding back to the war. I swear I have a romance novel that used a story just like this as a plot device. Except, again, this really happened. The Fitzgibbons had 17 children, but 12 of them died young, and only one son eventually outlived him. Despite this personal heartache, Fitzgibbon's reputation in the colony was on the rise. Already noted as a war hero, he was about to take on a new persona, the Riot Breaker. In the summer of 1824, several days of rioting broke out between Protestant old settlers and new Irish Catholic immigrants in the Ottawa Valley. It became known as the Bally Giblin Affair. Rather than sending in the military, the lieutenant governor instead sent one man, Fitzgibbon. The story goes that Fitzgibbon was able to win over the Catholics on his arrival because, completely unexpectedly, he began speaking to them in Irish. Born in County Limerick in 1780, Fitzgibbon's first language had been Irish. Forty-four years later, this ability gave him a shared identity with the new immigrants that the Orange magistrates and aloof colonial officials could never duplicate. In his report on the Bally Giblin affair, Fitzgibbon exonerated the Catholics from having instigated the violence and instead blamed the riot on the Orange sympathies of both the deputy sheriff and the special constables who had tried to arrest the Irish immigrants. Fitzgibbon's success with the Bally Giblin affair increased his already robust reputation in the colony. He was now the ultimate Irish enforcer of law and order. He was called upon again in Peterborough and in Cornwall to keep the peace and restore order amongst Irish workers and Orangemen, and he always acted alone. By the 1830s, James Fitzgibbon was still very much in the public eye. He was hailed in Toronto for his actions during the cholera epidemic of 1832, when he physically carried the sick to the hospital and unloaded carts of dead bodies at the burial grounds. That same year, he stopped another riot in Toronto single-handedly, dragging both Tories and reformers off to jail, and threatening to do the same to the riot's instigator, the future rebel leader William Lyon Mackenzie. To end the riot, Fitzgibbon manhandled Mackenzie back to the man's house and personally held the front door shut to stop Mackenzie from egging on the mob. However, the actions of the new lieutenant governor, Sir Francis Bondhead, in the lead-up to the 1837 Upper Canadian Rebellion put the aging Fitzgibbon on edge. Now, Bondhead is not my favorite person in Canadian history, 
I don't know if he's anyone's favorite person in Canadian history. The author Will Ferguson once wrote that, quote, appointing Bondhead was like turning a kangaroo loose in a minefield. Definitely. The man was a walking disaster. Bondhead embodied the worst aspects of imperial snobbery and incompetence. As Fitzgibbon's own granddaughter charmingly phrased it, in such a man, the rebels recognized their most useful ally. Ouch. Fitzgibbon wanted to prepare Toronto for what he saw as a very real threat of rebellion in 1837. Bondhead accused Fitzgibbon of being overzealous and an alarmist. Fitzgibbon wanted to begin defensive training. Bondhead sent away all available troops to put down the Lower Canadian Rebellion outside of Montreal. Then, on the very eve of violence breaking out in Toronto, Bondhead turned around and named Fitzgibbon as acting adjutant general of the militia, putting him in charge of untrained men who were completely unprepared to defend the city. In direct defiance of Bondhead, Fitzgibbon ordered for a militia picket on Young Street. His instincts were totally correct. The rebels marched into the city only a few hours later. Both sides exchanged a round of shots and then promptly fled in what the poet Dennis Lee once called the first mutual spontaneous retreat in the history of warfare. I swear, only in Canada. Fitzgibbon did lead the attack on the rebels' position at Montgomery's Tavern, but he resigned over Bondhead's decision to burn down the house of the rebel David Gibson, which Fitzgibbon thought was simple vindictiveness. The Upper Canadian Rebellion marked the end of Fitzgibbon's active career in Canada, and it was the first time that the colonial establishment seemed to turn against him. Money troubles, which had dogged him throughout his life, came to public attention when he was denied any payment or property grant for his services during the rebellion. By the mid-1840s, he was no longer the heroic veteran and riot-breaker, but a bitter and angry former public servant. He left the colony in 1847, the same year that over 100,000 Irish refugees fled to Canada in order to escape the Great Famine. Fitzgibbon, now a widower, spent the last 13 years of his life as one of the military knights at Windsor Castle, serving the crown in a much more intimate capacity than he had along the Canadian frontier. He died there in 1860 and was buried in the crypt of St. George's Chapel, the same resting place as Edward IV, Henry VIII, Charles I, and most recently, Prince Philip and Queen Elizabeth II. But Fitzgibbon's death only received two lines in the Toronto newspapers. When Fitzgibbon has been remembered in Canada, it's for his military service in 1812 and 1837. But these stories often portray him as a British officer, an exceptional man, but not an Irish man. His Catholic roots in County Limerick were forgotten, while the standards of heroism and physical manliness he embodied seemed either unbelievable or terribly old-fashioned as the world became a more modern, mechanical, and cynical place. As for me, I think Fitzgibbon was maybe too exceptional. He lived as a romantic soldier, a lauded war hero, a hard riot breaker, and a defender of the colony. But that just wasn't the same as the majority of Irishmen who settled in Canada. Fitzgibbon could be revered, but he couldn't be replicated. His legacy is also complicated because he was an Irishman who fought for the British Empire rather than against it. There were tens of thousands of Irishmen like him down through the centuries, but his actions weren't in line with those who wanted an Irish Republic, and that can be difficult for people to understand today. I do think James Fitzgibbon should be actively remembered as an important part of the Irish-Canadian story, if for no other reason than for this amazing advice that he once gave to his son Charles on a proper sex life for a gentleman. Against any vice, I almost flatter myself, I need not warn you. But the passions required to be guarded against 
with great diligence. To keep the high, happy ground of innocence is much more easy than to return to it if once you take a downward step. I wish I could convey to your mind the many melancholy examples I have seen in the army of young men who could not abstain from what they called pleasure, but which soon brought them to disappointment, misery, and a wretched end. You know, I'm not sure if even Jane Austen would know what to do with that one. Next time on The Irish in Canada, we'll look at a group of wild and murderous Irishmen during their reign of terror in that most violent, scandalous, and dangerous of cities, Ottawa. Thanks for listening to The Irish in Canada. The show was researched, written, and narrated by me, Jane McGaughy. This season was edited and mixed by Patrick McMaster and produced by Marion Mulvena. Our theme music was composed and performed by Kate Bevan Baker, and our logo was designed by Claire McCauley. Many thanks to the School of Irish Studies at Concordia University in Montreal, the Canadian Irish Studies Foundation, Le Gouvernement de Québec, and the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada for their support. If you like the show, please subscribe, rate, and review us on your favourite podcast app. You can spread the word about the Irish in Canada by following us on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram at Irish Canada Pod. Our website is the Irish in Canada Podcast.ca. That's where you can find show notes for our episodes, including lists of sources and recommendations for further reading. Until next time, Gora Maogif.